All right. Uh, I think I'm good to go and running on time, uh, so I'm going to get started. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, my name is Stephen Gordon. I'm a principal product manager at Red Hat uh, in the OpenStack group. Uh, today, I'm actually going to be talking about uh, some work that our scale and performance team have been doing around deploying containers at scale on OpenStack. Um, in terms of getting into that, though, I need to talk a little bit about some of the composite parts um, that make up the stack that we were doing the performance testing on and just give a little bit of context to how and why we're putting those together. Um, so obviously, we're here today at OpenStack Summit, uh, primarily talking about OpenStack, um, the open source uh, infrastructure platform. Um, for the purpose of this uh, testing, we're also using, uh, when we you know, talk about containers on OpenStack, and obviously there's a lot of buzz around this, uh, Kubernetes um, as an open source system for automating the uh, management, orchest orchestrating the deployment um, and management of containers. And that's what we're using as part of our OpenShift platform, which is our uh, enterprise um, container or orchestration uh, distribution. Um, so when we re-architected OpenShift around Kubernetes, uh, we were making a bet on community-powered innovation um, and that you know, this was an open source community with the kind of uh, velocity around it that we saw as being um, the one that would build the solution that would ultimately be successful in the market. And in a lot of ways, the way we've approached that application platform is very similar uh, to you know, the reasons we chose OpenStack for infrastructure in the first place um, as well. Um, so first of all, in terms of we're talking about uh, containers and OpenStack, you know, why run them on OpenStack in the first place? Um, and fundamentally, the way I look at that is around the exposition and consumption of resources. Uh, so tr traditionally, an operating system really did both jobs on a, on a single box. Uh, so if you think about the kernel, it was exposing uh, CPU, RAM, disk resources, and user space processes were consuming those um, on top. Um, in a distributed system, uh, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, first of all, our resources are not necessarily physical in nature. You know, there's been a move to software-defined infrastructure um, that we have to factor into this. And also part of that, obviously, is that it is distributed by nature. Um, so when we think about a container, it's primarily three things. Um, so when at rest, it's really just a file, um, but when running, it you know, could be considered effectively a fancy process or a fancy user space process at least. So in its rawest form, we're dealing with code, uh, so say my MySQL database server, uh, configuration for that database server or application uh, that's coming in uh, either via a, fi a file mount or via uh, uh, sharing through a secrets mechanism, and also the actual data, uh, which again is usually mounted across a from a volume across the network. Uh, but there's other more complex resources that we have to manage as well. Uh, so thinking about uh, networking, uh, we, need to, we need our load balancers, we need DNS. Um, you know, we, we may, may want to access you know, not just block volumes, but also file storage via something like Manila. These are all resources, uh, and that's really where OpenStack comes in, in terms of exposing those resources. So you know, uh, perhaps in college or somewhere else, people may have had the job or been requested to provision a new machine. Um, they got, a, got hardware, got a physical box, plug it in, give someone SSH access, we're done. Uh, but as we repeat that process over and over again, and also with more complex resources, um, that becomes unscalable. Uh, and that's when we look at something like OpenStack um, to help us with provisioning resources on demand effectively. Um, so then moving up from there, you know, why when we talk about uh, combining containers and OpenStack, are, are we at Red Hat uh, using OpenShift? Uh, and why do we want to combine those two? Uh, so this is really the consumption side of things. Uh, so OpenShift and, you know, by virtue of inclusion, Kubernetes, uh, consuming resources in a way that's transparent to the application uh, in that you as the application programmer shouldn't even really have to think about it. Uh, it's in terms of the integration of the two systems. So historically, when we're consuming resources via a process, uh, we, or we, historically, we were consuming resources via a process. Um, so, for example, the PS tree output on the right here. Um, in a modern distributed process, we really mean we're consuming uh, resources by firing up some number of containers distributed across my cluster um, and getting access to those shared services underneath that are provided by the infrastructure platform. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, what we're trying to get out of this um, is this mindset of loading applications at the factory, not the dock. Uh, the factory 
in effect being the developer laptop and the dock effectively being our production environment. Uh, so OpenShift allows us to iterate across, or OpenShift and Kubernetes rather, allow us to iterate across not just the developer laptop but have the same platform exposed uh, when we're running on our production clouds as well. Um, in terms of um, OpenShift um, and the way we build it, um, so it's what we call community powered innovation. Um, so talking about um, you know, the cloud of projects on the left, uh, so things like Project Atomic, Kubernetes, Docker, um, and even middleware projects like Wildfly, all fit into uh, what we would refer to as a midstream project, OpenShift Origin, uh, which is how we actually um, integrate all of these pieces in the open in, and ultimately build the product that becomes OpenShift Container Platform. Um, Red Hat is, of course, a leading contributor, uh, not just to OpenStack, but to Kubernetes and Docker and many of the other projects that make up this stack and combine to provide that platform. Um, so when we kind of look at that all put together in what comes OpenShift, um, so if we look at our footprints across the bottom, uh, physical, virtual, private, and public, um, obviously when we think about Open, OpenStack, we're really talking about primarily that private-public divide there on the two cloud systems. Uh, when we're talking about virtual, we might think about something like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization or a more traditional virtualization platform. Um, but as we, as we move up from that and we look at something like uh, Relatomic Host and what it's providing us in terms of a trusted container operating system, um, so it's effectively a small, fast, and secure footprint for running containers on. Um, so it's configured with cloud in it, um, updated using OS tree, uh, and includes host management from, using Cockpit. And that's effectively the base um, on top of which the container platform runs. Uh, so if we look at um, moving up from there, the set of blue boxes in the middle, uh, that's really the area where container orchestration is added into this picture via Kubernetes. Um, so that's including things like um, networking, storage, and registry functionality that we build around Kubernetes, uh, logging and metrics, security, uh, and so on. Um, we also rely in terms of the operating system on um, software collections to provide alternate runtimes and containers for those runtimes. Uh, so things like different versions of Python, Ruby, Node.js, et cetera, um, and so on. Um, another important part of this is in terms of looking at uh, lifecycle management and CI-CD. Um, so OpenShift also includes a source to image capability. Uh, so the idea that I as a developer can push effectively uh, from my Git tree um, directly to OpenShift uh, via either the CLI, CLI or the web UI. Um, and OpenShift will take care of uh, rebuilding the containers involved in that application uh, and pushing them uh, where I want to go in terms of my uh, be it dev, test, uh, production environment. Uh, so OpenShift is handling the automation of that all the way through the stack. Uh, so how do these actually work together? So what I want to talk about briefly is just some of the work that has been going on, uh, both in terms of the upstream community, um, but also um, at Red Hat in terms of combining uh, OpenShift and OpenStack. And again, by virtue of uh, inclusion, uh, Kubernetes, uh, which is where a lot of the rubber hits the road in terms of those two pieces uh, working together. Um, so if we look at our sandwich, um, we have our application at the top layer. Uh, we have OpenShift or the container platform, um, at least in the middle. And then we have our cloud, um, or effectively our cloud operating system in OpenStack at the infrastructure layer. So when we combine these, uh, there are a couple of architectural tenets to what we want to do um, that we want to ensure we maintain. Uh, so we want to have technical independence of the application. Uh, so my application developer at the top level shouldn't really be writing in the situation um, directly against the cloud APIs. Um, they should be able to write against the Kubernetes constructs um, knowing that those will be translated uh, to whatever cloud they have to be uh, on the back end and my operators are going to take care of making sure that linkage uh, lines up. Um, we want to avoid redundancy. Um, so we want to have um, less layers effectively um, between the application and the uh, cloud operating system and ultimately the bare, bare metal hardware. Um, some of that is still kind of a gap in the integration here. So things like Project Courier uh, are aimed at networking integration, for example, and eliminating um, the need for double encapsulation um, of the networking, both at the uh, Kubernetes layer and also at the uh, OpenStack layer. Um, we also you know, ultimately want to offer simplified management for this entire stack, um, so giving you the APIs you need to um, to manage it, um, and also that contextual awareness. So, 
Kubernetes itself or the container orchestration engine has to have the con contextual awareness to know, you know, when I'm on OpenStack and I want to get a volume, I go to Cinder. When I want a uh, load balancer, where do I go for that and so on in terms of cloud API endpoints. Um, I mentioned Courier as one of the things uh, that we're interested in adding to this in the future. Um, some other things, and uh, we're just upstairs actually at the uh, OpenStack uh, special interest group workshop, you know, other things people are talking about. Um, file share access via Manila, um, moving to load balancer v2, which is obviously becoming more urgent from an OpenStack point of view. Um, secret sharing, whether there's a potential for Barbican integration with Kubernetes and so on. These are kind of things we see looking forward as becoming important for people who want to run Kubernetes applications um, on top of OpenStack uh, with this kind of integrated experience. Um, so just, you know, in terms of how does this actually work in practice, uh, if I want to use the um, cloud provider uh, framework for open, uh, the implementation for OpenStack. Um, so Kubernetes has this concept of a cloud provider framework, which is how it effectively abstracts itself um, from the underlying cloud. So there's obviously implementations not just for OpenStack, but also for um, GC, AWS, uh, VMware, other platforms as well. Um, but at the end of the day, it all comes back to this kind of cloud config. Um, in terms of how do I tell um, Kubernetes where the endpoints are for my specific underlying infrastructure. Uh, so in the OpenStack case, it looks like this. Um, it has an authentication URL, uh, which obviously is our keystone endpoint. Uh, we give it a username and a password and a tenant ID in terms of what, what this cluster is going to authenticate as, uh, and also a region. Um, in, I don't think it made 1.4, but I think it'll probably be in Kubernetes 1.5. Uh, we're also going to have the ability to use Keystone Trusts, I believe. Um, and then finally, we also specify a subnet for our load balancer um, that's going to be actually used in front of the application traffic. Um, and then the last step there, and this, this specific one uh, that I have here in terms of editing the uh, Etsy uh, slash origin files, um, that's specific to OpenShift, um, but there's a similar step if you're just using Kubernetes directly in terms of configuring the masters and the minion nodes uh, with the correct cloud provider value, uh, which in this case obviously is OpenStack. All right, um, so with that kind of context setting out of the way, uh, we can move into our scalability testing in terms of what we've actually done uh, over the last couple of months uh, and what we're gonna be doing going forward as well. Um, so just in terms of um, Kubernetes community organization, uh, so there's a concept in Kubernetes of uh, special interest groups, um, or SIGs, uh, which I would equate loosely um, to the concept of a working group uh, in the OpenStack community. Um, so I mentioned, for example, there is an OpenStack SIG in the Kubernetes community. Um, there are also other ones listed here, so scheduling, cluster ops, and so on. Um, one of the things with the OpenStack SIG, so it's a coordination point for OpenStack related changes to Kubernetes, uh, but it's certainly not the only SIG that's working on OpenStack related things. Uh, so for example, in this particular case, we're actually talking more about the work of the scaling SIG, or the scalability SIG, sorry. Um, so the scalability SIG sets a number of SLAs uh, for themselves in terms of their expectations of what it means to scale uh, when we ramp up a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so in particular, API responsiveness. Uh, so I expect 99% of calls to return in uh, less than one second. Um, you know, and as I add, uh, add nodes to my uh, cluster, you know, do I keep maintaining that? At what point do I lose that, um, that SLA? Um, pod startup time, 99% of pods starting within five seconds as well. Um, they also define a number of other um, primary and derived metrics. So primary metrics include maximum number of cores per cluster, max pods per core, um, examples of derived metrics, um, so things like max cores per node, max pods per machine. Um, I should add the disclaimer in terms of the pod startup time uh, down the bottom here with pre-pulled -pull images. Uh, so what they're saying there is that when we talk about maxing out the scale of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, they're really taking the performance of the registry and the network in between the registry and the cluster out of the, out of the picture here. Um, so all of the images are pre-cached um, to remove that variability because we're really trying to stress um, the performance of Kubernetes itself as a scheduler and management piece. Um, so in terms of the goals moving into this exercise, uh, so people may be familiar with, I think around the Kubernetes 1.2 timeframe from an upstream scalability SIG point of view, um, there was testing done to prove out a 1,000 node um, Kubernetes cluster. 
Uh, so we obviously want to set, uh, validate that when we talk about OpenShift Container Platform and validating what we've done with the product, uh, we certainly don't want to have introduced any additional scalability bottlenecks on top of that. Uh, so it, it's in, in part revalidating what we've already done um, and having a reference design around that. Uh, but also in pushing to that limit and beyond, trying to identify, okay, what issues do we hit? Um, which of these are configuration related? Which of these are actually related to the code base? Um, how do we track and address those going forward so that we can then push beyond that to 2,000, 5,000, so on? Um, and then obviously documenting those things via issues and patches uh, in the upstream community. Um, so obviously to do any serious scalability testing, you need hardware. Um, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, via Intel have a cluster um, with 1,000 nodes of bare metal hardware available for community um, projects, basically, to use for testing. Uh, for those who are familiar with the OSIC lab for OpenStack, it's basically the same concept. And in fact, it's 1,000 boxes in the same data center. Um, but the idea is similar. So if you're doing work on a CNCF-related project, um, be it one that's already under the CNCF governance or you know, related to those areas, um, around cloud native computing. You can go to the GitHub link here. You can uh, file a PR or an issue for access to the system. Um, and you know, depending on you know, how good a case you state effectively for the type of work you're doing, uh, you'll get some limited time access uh, to be able to run scale testing or whatever other type of testing you need to. Um, but it is, it is kind of a, a not a one-time thing, but short bursts effectively. So it's not like you can, it's, it's different to something like OpenStack Infra, which is more um, continuously running jobs on an ongoing basis. Um, so the node specs are listed here. Uh, they aren't particularly important in and of themselves. Um, the only thing I would highlight is that out of that 1,000 node cluster, uh, what we actually got was 300 physical nodes, uh, which is what we deployed OpenStack on. And then on top of that, we were running um, however many OpenShift VMs we needed to scale up the Kubernetes cluster effectively. Um, the other thing that's probably worth noting, uh, the VM image disk. Uh, so we're actually using the Intel NVMe disks there uh, for that as well. Uh, so our total pool of hardware, so 300 nodes, uh, 14,000 CPUs, or 14,000 plus CPUs, um, and you know, plenty of RAM and storage to go with that. Um, in terms of the software that we ran on this, um, so we tested on a, from a hypervisor point of view. Uh, so we're using Red Hat OpenStack Platform 8 Liberty at the time. So this testing was done in August, I think. Um, there is currently an effort underway of some different hardware to try and uh, spin a retest with some newer versions of the software. Um, so we used OpenStack Platform 8. Uh, so that meant RHEL 7.2 hosts. Um, and we used OpenShift Container Platform 3.3. Uh, so that was alpha code uh, using Kubernetes 1.3 at the time. Um, that version of OpenShift is now actually uh, generally available and productized. Um, and in terms of the architecture diagram, uh, which I don't think I've missed any off of here, uh, so I'm going to move kind of from uh, left to right. Um, so we have the OpenStack Undercloud box, uh, which has uh, where it says director, that's really the product name for triple O, so the upstream triple O project that we use as a deployment tool. Uh, we also use that single box uh, effectively as a jump box, uh, so it also has some Ansible stuff on it and Grafana. Um, we use that to deploy our OpenStack cloud. Uh, so we have the three controller nodes. Uh, we actually divide it up into uh, two host aggregates for both the uh, high available infra part and the uh, high availability catch all. Um, the reason for that is we did some concurrent testing um, using different deployment mechanisms. Uh, so there's actually two different approaches you can use to deploy OpenShift on OpenStack at the moment. So we have a set of um, OpenShift Ansible playbooks, um, but we also have some heat templates um, that do some of the pre-configuration for you. So we wanted to divide up the infrastructure to allow us to test both mechanisms side by side effectively. Um, so we deploy in that HA infra, um, those two host aggregates, uh, a number of master nodes, and then a number of etcd nodes, uh, which will become important in a moment. Um, and then in the support AZ, um, in that availability zone, we have the routing, the registry capabilities, uh, metrics and logging. So effectively, uh, supporting capabilities for the actual application cluster. Um, and then in the catch-all host aggregates, we have the actual nodes themselves. So these are the Kubernetes minions where the workloads are actually going to end up running. Um, and the infra JMeter nodes on the far right uh, where we're actually generating the load from. Um, 
So just you know, briefly breaking that down in terms of the architecture here. Um, so the masters uh, in OpenShift parlance uh, are effectively uh, the same thing as a Kubernetes master. Uh, there are some additional uh, management capabilities on there. Um, and then we have our actual nodes, the minions, running the pods, um, so actual application clusters. Um, around that, as I mentioned, we have the uh, SCM, so the source to image pipeline, um, directly from your application source and the CI CD workflow. Um, moving on, so in terms of actually generating the load and also some of the pre configuration in the environment, uh, there's a set of tools called the System Verification Test Suite. Um, so these are on GitHub, our performance and scale team put these tools together. They're not actually supported in product, but they're how they exercise, exercise the product uh, to perform the uh, performance testing. Um, so the main things, um, uh, cluster loader, which is how the load is actually generated, um, networking, workload generator, um, and reliability testing. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, the way the images are built, and there's tooling for that also in that repository as well. Um, so when I talk about the image provisioner, uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that they wanted to take um, the time or the variability introduced by pulling from the registry and from the network uh, throughput out of the equation and test purely the Kubernetes um, scheduling and orchestration. Um, so to do that, um, we used some RHEL pre-configured image, images using the image provisioner uh, to preload additional RPMs and also to preload the container images. And then we use that to actually provision uh, each of the OpenShift nodes. Uh, so some of the things that we're using Ansible to do on that image, um, file system setup, RHEL OS setup, um, pulling in the OpenShift RPMs, um, pulling in those container uh, images, and so on. Um, so the clust cluster loader architecture, um, so the cluster loader, again, is another part of the SVT. Um, and effectively what it's doing is for some type of object, uh, so here quota, template, service, user, pod, um, replication controller, uh, there are a couple of others counted in the next slide. But effectively we give it a number of those that we want to create, um, and it just loops and creates them using the APIs. And that's running from the uh, JMeter boxes on the side of the architecture diagram. Um, so what did we actually learn uh, from the testing that was done? Um, so ultimately, we did get to our 1,000 node goal, uh, although we did hit some issues along the way, uh, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, and associated with those runs, you know, 13,000 pro projects and 52,000 pods were created. Um, you know, those are the numbers that we have currently. Uh, obviously, the goal is to stretch those further uh, in coming Kubernetes and OpenStack releases. Um, so in terms of issues encountered, um, so the first one that came up was the etcd disk utilization at scale. Um, was actually quite a bit higher, and also the RAM utilization for that matter, uh, and CPU. Um, the reason for that was that the, for every object we're creating, so any of those different types of objects the cluster loader is creating, um, those objects put something into etcd. Um, and thus, as a result of that, the outcome was that we actually increased our guidance for large environments uh, to 20 gig of RAM. Um, I think the max we got to here was about 12.5, but obviously as we want to push beyond, uh, we're currently thinking that you need a lot more um, memory backing the etcd um, nodes, or on the masters, rather. Um, the other issue encountered in the test runs, the API server CPU, you can kind of see um, a little ways in here, we start getting spikes um, across the graph in the CPU utilization. Uh, we actually found that that was occurring because of the Kubernetes master uh, was effectively um, panicking and restarting. Uh, on a fairly predictable basis once it got going. Um, and that started around 13,000 cluster loader objects um, and uh, 52,000 pods, which I think you saw as the high water mark on the previous slide. Um, so that's actually been rectified upstream and pulled into the final version of OpenShift 3.3. Um, so I think that's in Kubernetes 1.3 as well. Um, and I have a PR in the notes here, uh, which I can share later as well. Um, the other issue, which was a little bit of a surprise, so I mentioned that in terms of installing OpenShift, we use uh, OpenShift Ansible um, to drive the actual uh, installation and configuration of the software on both the master nodes and the minions, and also some of those supporting resources uh, like the routers and the registry. Uh, we found when we, we'd originally done some of this testing using Ansible 1.9, uh, and we moved up to Ansible 2.2. 
Um, and we found that the Ansible Playbooks process uh, started really thrashing the CPU at some point in that process. Um, so the reason we eventually found out um, was that the uh, recursive includes in Ansible 2.2 uh, were broken somewhat in that they were um, not cleaning up properly and as you recursively loaded more and more playbooks you would get more, more and more uh, memory and CPU usage um, ultimately due to uh, thrashing the memory and moving into cache. Um, so we did some research on that and we found it had actually been reported independently um, into the Ansible uh, issue tracker uh, and we were able to fix that and update that in Ansible and in the playbooks themselves as well. Uh, so now with OpenShift 3.3 uh, we were able to get that back to normal and the runtime um, around 22 minutes with expected memory usage so that was to deploy the cluster uh, from an OpenShift Ansible point of view. Um, in terms of other bugs filed and encountered, so that was kind of just the probably high-level high ones, um, one of the most critical ones we found. Uh, we did file a number of other issues across, uh, across uh, Kubernetes, uh, the OpenShift installer, um, the Docker images, uh, and so on. Um, these are variously broken down by um, their component categories from an OpenShift point of view, uh, but all relate to an individual upstream issue as well. Um, in terms of what next, uh, the most obvious one is that there's uh, a need to get to 2,000 nodes uh, kind of as soon as possible. Ideally, we'd like to do that for OpenShift 3.4, uh, and that's what we're attempting to validate um, in the coming months. Um, the other thing um, we want to do is um, identify from that process the upper limits and any uh, additional issues we encounter getting to 2,000 uh, so that we can track those from an upstream perspective for Kubernetes 1.5 and 1.6. Um, and then kind of the long-term yardstick that we have is to get to 5,000 nodes sometime in uh, 2017 calendar year. Um, so that's what we're currently focused on from, in terms of moving through the scale points I discussed here. Um, the other thing is that the total number of nodes is not really the only scale point you're interested in. Um, so another one that's increasingly seeing some interest is uh, in terms of persistent volumes. Um, you know, what's the total number of persistent volumes we can configure through the Kubernetes provided interfaces, um, particularly here relevant to um, Kubernetes on OpenStack, but also for other providers as well. Uh, and what's the rate of allocation as we do that? So if I'm um, using dynamic provisioning, for example, uh, from a Kubernetes standpoint, how many volumes can I provision on a constant basis? What's that rate look like? What's the maximum? At what point do I hit bottlenecks in that process? Um, in terms of uh, some final notes here, so a lot of this content is from a blog post um, deploying a thousand nodes of OpenShift on the CNCF cluster. Um, so that's there and has some more uh, information in terms of links to PRs and so on. Um, I also want to call out the work of the Red Hat Performance and Scale Engineering team. Um, so all of these folks are available on Twitter um, that I have here. Um, and it's actually their Trello board. So I talked a little bit here about their future goals um, for scaling. Um, Kubernetes on OpenStack and in general. Um, so the Trello board for the scalability team is actually open. Um, so you can track what they're doing um, there. And, you know, it's all publicly available if you want to see um, what, what challenges they're setting themselves effectively and you know, how their work is progressing. Um, the other thing I wanted to call out is that there's a uh, Kubernetes um, container expert lounge upstairs um, or actually out here to the right somewhere. Um, so some folks from Google and other various people are going to be staffing that throughout the week. Um, if you have Kubernetes related questions, uh, that's where you can find them um, and ask those. Um, and that's it from me, um, but we do have a microphone on the side here if people want to ask questions and we can try and drill into those. Any takers? All righty, no questions. Not even one? Let's grab the mic here. Well, a bit basic question about the structure of the contents of the, uh, the open shift. Yeah. So Kubernetes is part, Docker is, and well, Magnum, and so you have the proprietary maybe Red Hat code of, of, of the product, and inside of it you have Kubernetes, maybe Docker or 
you can select any container. What else is inside the Protect protocol? So there's nothing in there that's actually proprietary. So all of it, as I mentioned, that OpenShift origin um, upstream or midstream project, um, all of the code is either available there or in a further upstream. So Kubernetes and Docker are very clear examples where there's another upstream. Um, but there's also you know, some utilities um, and some of the image pipeline, for example, the source to image pipeline. Um, that's open source as well. Um, so it's on github.com slash openshift, I believe. Um, so all of that's available there. Um, and you know, there's a number of different categories across that block diagram I showed, um, which all of which have their own individual upstreams effectively. It's, it's similar to how you build you know, the operating system distribution. There's not really one place you go and all of, the, all of the projects that are in the operating system come from that place. It's really pulling together the aggregate of that cloud of relevant upstreams and integrating them. And the integration piece is really the, what you start to see in OpenShift Origin where some of those things are being glued together a little more tightly than they might be in the upstream. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, did you uh, measure any data in terms of um, external systems watching the Kubernetes API? What impact uh, we might expect from that? Because one of the beautiful things of Kubernetes is you can watch the API, so it attracts people to code that way. My, my understanding with the testing of that 1,000 node limit was including monitoring for those API metrics I mentioned. So the uh, less than 5, 000, five seconds to spin up a new, um, a new pod and the uh, less than one second response time. Uh, so part of the testing is watching for those things and making sure um, that they're still valid. So what we're effectively saying is at some point beyond 1,000, at least for this set of tests, um, those metrics started failing and that's where we start to see bottlenecks or we report issues because the goal for the project is really to maintain, maintain those SLAs um, no matter the scale. But obviously, at, at this point in time, there are limits to that, and we have to identify what are the blockers, what's causing the delay effectively when we reach certain points. So, so when we say, what, what I'm saying is when we, get, when we say we scaled to 1,000 nodes, we're really talking about with those metrics intact. Um, and that's part of, part of the scale testing is monitoring for those things. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for your time. I appreciate your attendance.